Welcome to the Leadership Coaching Summit. My name is Joel and in this session we're going to be exploring how we can hack flow to learn and lead better than ever. And we're going to be doing that with Jamie Wheel from the Flow Genome Project. And their mission is to reverse engineer the genome of the peak performance state known as flow. So Jamie's worked with Fortune 500 companies such as Abbott Laboratories, Fidelity Investments and Affiliated Computer Services and he's also on the faculty of the Esalen Institute where he leads annual programs on integral leadership and he's working actively within the conscious capitalism community as chief of staff. So Jamie's going to present for around 35 minutes and then we'll end with me asking him a few questions. So over to you Jamie. So today we are going to talk about the peak performance state known as flow and to do that it kind of makes sense to go back a few decades and just kind of begin with its origin stories. About 30 years ago Dr. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi at the University of Chicago launched the largest study of optimal psychology that the world had seen to date and he spent about 10 years going around the world and interviewing people of all shapes and sizes uh, about what what they looked and felt like when they were at their best. And he started with kind of the usual high performing suspects, rock climbing athletes from Yosemite National Park in California, <clears throat> skiers, musicians, um, and everybody at the top of their game, and then went further and further afield, uh, Korean grandmothers, um, Japanese motorcycle gangs. He, he really was curious as to, uh, regardless of what our sort of social conceptions of being at our best were, how did people feel when they were really at the top of their game? And what he came up with was some stunning findings, which was, number one, that the people who had the most flow experiences in their life uh, were the happiest people on earth. And number two, that they didn't get that way by accident. That the very term flow really wasn't one he came up with to start with, but it came out of all the interviews that when people were describing how they felt when they were performing at their best, they literally described it as a fluid, flowy experience, that one thing just led to another, that there was no conscious effort. And so not only did, did people who had the most flow were the happiest, but they had literally built their lives around having more of it. So let's take a moment now and just kind of define terms so we can kind of all orient here. Uh, the lingo around flow states or peak performance states is sort of endless. Uh, the experience itself is actually fairly timeless. Um, in the uh, Back in the 50s, even earlier in the, into the 30s, jazz musicians used to call it being in the pocket. In the, by the time the 70s rolled around, or actually we will do it chronologically, uh, in the 50s, Abraham Maslow uh, gave it the term that many of us are familiar with, the peak experience. In the 70s, uh, Jim Fix, the famous kind of running advocate, uh, you know, attached the notion of the runner's high, which is in some respects a kind of partial and low-grade flow state. Uh, Phil Jackson, the basketball coach of the Chicago Bulls and then the LA Lakers, you know, responsible, I think, for 11 um, NBA championships, uh, explicitly taught meditation and, and basically what he called being in the zone to all of his athletes, including Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. So across cultures and across time, we've all had different words for it, um, but we've all experienced it. Uh, flow itself is ubiquitous and a universal human condition, uh, whether or not we actually have a label and understand it. But when we are in flow states, some interesting things happen. <clears throat> the first is that time itself uh, tends to get distorted. Uh, it can slow down, it can speed up. It's if, if you're surfing a wave and you get actually barreled in what's known as the tube where you're literally, like, like in this image here, you're sort of tucked down in the wave itself, um, a few seconds could feel like five or ten minutes. If you get lost in a wonderful conversation at dinner uh, on, on a first date, you know, it may, it, three hours may go by and it only felt like half an hour. But we, our normal sense of linear time tends to disappear. And really beautifully, our sense of self also does as well. Our normal waking self uh, tends to take a back seat. We get lost uh, in, the, in the moment, in the, in the activity itself. So beer and doer become one. Action and awareness uh, get integrated and we have these amazing, amazing experiences and sort of even though they last only for moments or seconds, we typically, um, they, they serve as sort of flashbulb memories. They serve as these anchors that we then orient the rest of our lives trying to get back to. 
Now, for a long, long time, we, you know, we referenced you know, elite athletes, um, certainly uh, military, uh, special, special operations um, are, an, are another great uh, community who have been trying to advocate and accelerate these performances. Those guys, neither of them would want to be talking about this too much. And then you talk about rock climbers, surf bums, ski bums, uh, jazz musicians. Those guys tended to be sort of on the fringes of mainstream society, often kind of marginalized for their pursuit of this stuff. Uh, but in the last 10 or 15 years, this research has really kind of entered the mainstream and it's really entered organizational awareness. Uh, McKinsey and Company, the obviously global consulting firm, they, they just can included a 10-year study of their own and they found that senior knowledge workers in flow states were up to five times more effective uh, than those who weren't. And if you think about that for a moment, that's, that alone is a staggering fact because what it means is if you really, if you sort of treated yourself like almost like a Tour de France athlete, you know, who has a personal chef and who has a masseuse and who has a bike mechanic, who has, you know, this entire team of people uh, just so that you could get on the bike and pedal each day, right? Imagine if we treated our executives in that same way where all, they, all we had to do was have them in flow states one day a week and they would be keeping pace with their competition. And if they were in flow states two days a week and spent the other five simply recovering and preparing, they would be outpacing the marketplace by 100%. So that alone really kind of unlocks the door. And if, if, we, if I leave you guys with anything today, um, we'll come back and touch on this later, which is just this notion that flow now buttressed and supported by the empirical research around how much of a turbo button it is on performance, lets us go slow to go fast. The idea of rather than just trying to redline things and do more quicker faster, that sort of sense of almost industrial efficiency, that knowledge work is harder than that. Knowledge work is subtler than that. And that actually if we back off the relentless pursuit of getting more done, we actually get more done. And in the mountaineering world, there's a great adage that always says, go slow to go fast, right? If you try and if you fumble, if you drop your ropes, if you drop your anchors, if you do something stupid, that is inevitably going to take you more time, cost you more time than if you're slow, deliberate, and methodical. And McKinsey themselves have just kind of put a real stake in the ground here saying, uh, this is true in, in an order of magnitude no one have, would have thought. James Slavitt out of Greylock Venture Partners in Silicon Valley, responsible for investing in many of the biggest brands coming out of the valley in the last decade, uh, went as far as saying in Forbes magazine that flow states is the number one management metric you need to know. If you're trying to manage knowledge workers, the amount of time they spend in flow is your single biggest indicator of ROI, return on investment, on your human capital, meaning literally your salaries and, and costs. And lastly, there are a number of companies which are now getting, getting with the program well beyond kind of, again, just using Silicon Valley as an example of kind of progressive organizational design, but, you know, well beyond Razor scooters in the hallway and Xboxes and beanbags in the, in the break rooms. Um, there are a number of companies that are explicitly designing both their working routines, you know, you, you choosing your own schedules, uh, working environments. Yvonne Schwinard at Patagonia literally has a let my people go surfing when the swell is breaking outside the Patagonia offices. You are allowed and encouraged to go out into the waves and get a session in, not because simply there are a bunch of, you know, there, there are a bunch of outdoorsy people, but when you have flow in one domain, i.e. of your choice, whether it's, you know, video games or playing music or being outside doing some form of athletic activity, it actually translates to more flow in the other areas of your life. So Patagonia employees that are experiencing flow in the ocean can come back and have more flow in the workplace. The neural networks that are, they're building as they form these experiences actually translate across domains and subjects. So I want to kind of just tee up uh, the three big ideas here, which would be, you know, I mean, the, the world is vast in studying peak performance, but if we leave our time together today uh, just with a few of them in mind, I think it would be a great success. Uh, the first is and sort of why flow, why flow is useful uh, in your role as leadership coaches and consultants. The first is that when we're in flow states, uh, as we already alluded to, uh, our inner critic goes silent. And uh, we'll, we'll unpack that in some more detail, um, but that is a phenomenally important component of what, what, what the impact and what the leverage is of dropping into flow. Number two, flow makes learning more fun and it actually makes learning much faster. 
and number three, flow for the first time in history with the advent of all of all of this measurement and all of kind of the empirical validation, as well as this era of sort of hackable smart or wearable smart tech, has made something that used to be just we had to wait for lightning to strike to now something where we can almost build our own Tesla coils. We can manufacture this stuff. So flow silences our inner critic, flow accelerates our path to mastery, and flow itself is hackable. So the first thing to think about is how much of the self-help movement, how much of pop psychology, how much of any kind of contemporary psychological or spiritual seeking is, and even actually let's throw in pharmaceuticals, right? All three of those categories are fundamentally geared around getting our inner Woody Allen off our backs. We have this relentless inner critic right, which is a byproduct of evolution. <laughs> he shows up with executive functioning and all those other very cool, worthwhile things, uh, those personality capabilities of our prefrontal cortex, right? But he just never shuts up. And over time, that can become incredibly, incredibly fatiguing for all of us. But what happens in a flow state is fascinating. We actually, the, our inner critic goes silent. And there's, there's some interesting things that are happening on a neuroanatomical level. Uh, the, the, the term for it is called transient hypofrontality. And really, that's just a, a complicated way of saying that for a little while, the front of our brains, that complex neocortical part, actually just goes silent. We, you would have thought, that, like if I'm in my superhuman flow state, right, that I would have all of my brain firing on all cylinders, that whole you know, false but um, ubiquitous adage that we only use 10% of our brains. Well, the idea, you know, we would think, hey, in flow states, I must be using 100%. And that's actually, that's, that's not true at all. Funnily enough, um, the front neocortical part shuts down. It goes dead quiet in MRI scans. And what we're left with is a much kind of deeper, more integrated and quieter sense of self from which to operate. The next thing to think about is that flow literally makes learning things irresistibly enjoyable. The technical term that Csikszentmihalyi, the uh, PhD that we alluded to at the beginning of our talk, uh, he named it autotelic, which comes from the Greek, which just means auto and teleos, which means it has its own meaning um, that is intrinsically rewarding. So said another way, you know, you never have to uh, set the alarm to get up on a powder day right? Musicians uh, jamming, uh, never have to say, oh, today, today's the day we're going to, you know, we're going to hang outside and you know, play, play our guitars on the porch, right? There are certain activities that we are unavoidably, or even, even telling kids, you know, <laughs> kids will go outside and go sledding, right? Until they can't feel their fingers anymore and there's not any more light in the sky, right? That, those are the autotelic moments that are connected with flow states. So rather than that notion that was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell and others of some of the research at uh, Cambridge and uh, Stanford and Columbia around expert performance and 10,000 hours to mastery, um, rather than delaying gratification, rather than saying, I am going to practice for 10 years, four hours a day, right, so that I can win a gold medal, so that I can become first chair in the symphony, so that I can earn a, a million dollars, whatever my long-term delayed goal is, we can actually use our immediate gratification of I can't wait to do this again uh, as our actual driver. And I think there's really something potentially powerful and profound there um, because it sort of upends the Protestant work ethic. It upends that notion of, you know, struggle now, salvation later. But there's also another side to this coin around Flo's relationship to learning. And that is literally not only does it make the path itself more enjoyable, it literally cuts that path in half. What would have taken 10,000 hours in a normal state of consciousness can take 5,000 or less if you know how to harness flow. There were two interesting studies, one conducted by DARPA, which is a um, governmental, a federal uh, governmental branch of the military services dedicated in the, in, in the U.S., dedicated to sort of, you know, skunk works, um, projects on new technology and innovation. And they actually found a way to basically give jumper cable lobotomies to uh, snipers, to marksmen. And what they would do is put a magnetic pulse across that very same uh, neocortex that would literally just kind of shut it out. Could you? 
and for about 20 minutes um, the soldiers were then in a state of a sort of magnetically or mechanically induced flow state and as they learned target acquisition during that time about they, they were able to do it in less than half the time. A civilian study that mimicked a similar thing uh, in the sense that they were, they were using uh, rifle marksmanship as their, their goal um, got, it, got to it in a different way. Rather than using uh, magnetic stimulation, they just did, um, they just entrained the brain waves of the people that were, of, of, the, um, of the learners so that their brain waves were uh, oscillating in an alpha brain wave frequency and they too more than half the time. So the, the results of this um, are you know, potentially revolutionary. It's, it's almost becomes like Neo in the Matrix where he's just kind of downloading programs on becoming a martial artist or doing whatever he's doing. The ability to accelerate learning like that is uh, sort of fascinating and unprecedented. And Csikszentmihalyi, by the way, just as a quick sidebar, did also look into educational systems, not so this is all kind of black ops and, and spooky stuff, um, and found that both Montessori learning and Waldorf learning had a disproportionately sort of well-honed culture and approach to induce the kind of deep selfless concentration and accelerated learning cycles that he had found with flow and other domains. So for those of you listening at home uh, with little ones or with an interest in education, uh, those are certainly two areas of deep research and there is some explicit, uh, there are some explicit academic papers on the content. So the last part, if we remember flow is, flow is selfless, right? It lets, us, it lets us let go of our inner critic for those moments of, of calm and, and peace. Uh, flow is also, uh, it wildly accelerates the path of learning and makes it meaningfully more enjoyable. And lastly, flow itself is hackable. And what I want to do just briefly here is just walk us through what does that actually look like in, in a cycle and a, pro and a progression. Because this is, this is, while this is kind of an amalgamation of the last couple of decades of research, it has never quite been put together in all these ways. And what this really allows us to do, if we think about it, is really upend, again, that whole human growth, human potential move, movement of how can I get rid of my ego? Right? The idea here becomes don't worry about it. We know, right back to that Woody Allen uh, discussion, we know that if we can get to flow states, right? That part of our brain just goes dormant. So all we need to do is not keep, keep playing with that tar baby, using our ego to try and get rid of our ego. All we have to do is just shift the rest of our biological, neurological self system into the place where we are in flow and then see who's home. And that's a radical, radical reversal on how most human growth, human potential, um, you know, pop psychology, um, any of these categories it is completely turns them upside down and lets us sneak in the back door of some of the best, most rewarding states possible. So let's just take about five minutes and walk through this state. Right, the first is just like uh, M. Scott Peck and the Road Less Traveled, just like uh, Buddha's first Four Noble Truths. Right, life uh, begins with struggle. And in fact, we don't get into flow states if we are not pushing ourselves beyond our current known limits. It's, it's virtually impossible to sort of drop into a flow state tying your shoes, driving to work, or doing something that we're sort of on autopilot around. But when we're in this struggle state, right, um, let's, do, let's just sort of unpack what's happening. The first thing that's happening is we're in a bit of a tug of war. This is almost kind of like the angel and the devil on our shoulder between our neocortex, right, our executive function. Here I am, a capable, competent, rational agent in control of my own destiny trying to solve this problem, right, head on with logic, um, and my amygdala. My little sort of lizard brainy fight or flight, is this something scary? <clears throat> Should I get away from here? What's going on? And we tend to sort of, we toggle back and forth on those very rapidly. Our brain waves are in a kind of semi-agitated beta state, right? And the stress hormones that we, you know, were evolved in us to let us have these quick bursts of energy and performance running, you know, it's sort of escaping the proverbial saber-toothed tiger. All right, those are flooding our system. Our heart rate jacks up um, and our stress hormones are on high alert. Now, if we just stay in this stage, um, we, will, we will end up collapsing into fight or flight. 
and that's kind of game over, right? We just sort of end up just there down on the mortal coil. Life is nasty, brutish, and short, and we don't really get beyond that. Um, but if by hook or by crook, if, if by luck or by wisdom, uh, we allow ourselves to shift out of this pattern uh, into the release stage, something wonderful will happen. And typically, we, we move, we find our way into that release stage through one of two doors. One is, um, it's just kind of dumb luck, i.e. exhaustion, frustration, right, release. We, we, we chuck our laptop out the window. We decide to go for a long walk or a car. We, we hop in a shower. We, do some, we go to bed. We sleep on it. We do something that changes the channel. We cannot handle that peak arousal state of the struggle stage, and something gives. Or it could be a sign, you know, a sign of wisdom, and this is why knowing this, this cycle is so helpful. But when we're up against that brick wall of struggle and we do something to change the channel, we can end up in this release phase. And what happens there is our brain waves start slowing down from agitated beta into a more relaxed and alert alpha. Nitric oxide, this amazing neurotransmitter, flushes all of those stressed out hormones out of our system. And we are literally breathing easier. We are probably not worry gutting the problem as intensely. We've, we've sort of set it aside. We've either, we've either resigned ourselves to the fact that it's impossible or we've just chosen for our own sanity to set it aside for a while. And that puts us right onto the doorstep of the flow state itself. And if we're lucky, our brain waves continue to slow down and they end up entering the theta state. And theta is a, is a pretty rare brainwave state for most of us to occupy. Typically, the only times we touch on it is when you're sort of drifting off to sleep. It's that sort of hypnagogic, I'm asleep, I'm awake, I'm sort of dreaming, I'm in that spacey zone. And most of us, when we get there, will literally just nod off. It's a state of pretty deep relaxation and not a lot of actually, I'm actually doing real things in the real world. Uh, Tibetan monks, seasoned and practiced meditators, can get here and spend more time and remain awake during it, but for the most of us without explicit training, the, uh, it's, it's just it's a pass-through state uh, on the way to unconsciousness. But in a flow state, when we're actually engaged in something but no longer trying to, trying to force the feel, we're feeling the force, right? There's an old snowboarding bumper sticker, right? Feel the force, don't force the feel. And you could argue that in that theta state, that's when we really are allowing that stuff to happen versus us trying to make it happen. And we get on, we, and what comes on board at that point are a host of some of the most potent, amazing feeling neurochemicals on Earth. So we start with dopamine, which, as we all know, is one of the most powerful intrinsic reward systems. This is what comes up when they put, you know, rats in little mazes with those little cocaine dispensaries, all of those kind of things. Dopamine squirts, right, hit our brain and flood us um, with a sensation of, yes, you're onto something. Keep doing this. This is the right way. This is fine. You know, this is the hunter-gatherer finding the bright red berries that don't, you know, that taste great and don't kill you. This is, oh, this is, this is the little, you know, email floaty inbox. This is checking my Facebook to see if anybody sent me a message. All of these have little dopamine reward systems, right, to say, keep doing what you're doing, and it feels fantastic. Next come the endorphins, and the endorphins, as we know, again, um, they're, they're synthetic analog, uh, typically the opioids, and, and tragically, right, in the realm of oxycontin, oxy, yeah, oxycontin and, and hydrocodone and all of these prescription pharmaceuticals that are killing people in record numbers, right? We are going after those sensations in synthetic ways, in very, very destructive ways with tragic results. But when we can harness them, ma made from our own brains, they are, they are some of the most powerful feel-good chemicals um, that we can produce with, with no addictive capacities. So when the endorphins come on board, um, we, act we feel no pain. Right? They're amazing analgesics, and they are sort of mild euphorians. And lastly, anandamide, which is an endocannabinoid, um, actually massively boosts lateral thinking. So now I'm starting to connect things that I never thought of before. I'm starting to have those eureka aha insights. And when all of these come together, right, when all of these come together in our bodies and brains and, and minds, um, we will often have these bursts of gamma wave brain activity. And this gamma wave stuff, those are the lightning bolt sort of shazam ahas. 
And those can only happen when our brain's in that theta state and when we have that suite of neurochemical cocktails juicing us along. So at that moment, right, the world's at our fingertips. We feel like Superman, right? Everything is possible. We can literally think it, be it, do it, and it's done. But flow is a state. And so it comes and it goes. And when it goes, it leaves us in the final place. Recovery. And on the one hand, you think that's wonderful. But in reality, that can be a real bummer. Because when you were Superman, and then you wake up and you've got kryptonite in your pocket, uh, the letdown can be very hard for some people. What happens here is we sort of get the basking afterglow of what we've accomplished. There's serotonin flooding our system, there's oxytocin, which boosts kind of trust and connectivity if we were sharing this experience with others. And if we're allowing ourselves to rest deeply, right, we do an awful lot of memory consolidation and leveling up. This is where we, we hit a peak and we're now weaving that into our plateau. We're taking a state and we're rolling it into our stage of development. And if and as when we're sleeping deeply we're, and, and we're dropping into delta brainwaves, that's actually when we're integrating all of this new information to become our new working self. And if we look at this cycle, this really is kind of the roadmap to hacking ultimate human performance. And, and the key here, if we just sort of, again, you can, you can take the details for what they are. If you're just kind of like geeking out on this stuff like I do, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, but if you just kind of want the big so what's, I would say the biggest so what is, again, flow is a state, right? And it comes and it goes. And number two, if you look at both the recovery and struggle phase, they're back to back. So if, I, if all I knew was I'm in flow or I'm out of it, if I kind of thought of it like a binary light switch, right, then all the time I was out of it, I would hate or resist. Rather than saying, oh, I've come out of it and now I'm doing the necessary integration of the recovery stage. And then seamlessly transitioning right into the struggle of the very next flow state. And when I'm in that struggle phase, it can be amazingly hard to go easy on ourselves, to give out, to, to, to treat ourselves. Remember that, that whole inner critic, right? Typically, our inner critic is in high alert at those times. And if we treat ourselves a little more gently, right, during these phases, and we understand where we are as we move through them, we can move through them with less pain, with less suffering, and with more efficiency. So lastly, I just want to speak briefly to kind of our roles. So what does this mean for us, you know, as trusted advisors? What does this mean for us in our role working with organizations, working with leaders, and how can we uh, bring more of this into our work? And clearly, I mean, I would imagine, you know, all of the stuff we've just talked about, applying it to peak performers, uh, again, like executives, anything, that, that's relatively straightforward. Uh, there's some great work. Jim Lair and Tony Schwartz um, um, have written a series of good articles for Harvard Business Review, starting with The Corporate Athlete. Another one is called Manage Your Energy, Not Your Time. They don't explicitly discuss flow states, but they absolutely highlight the importance of the kind of uh, physiological components of peak performance uh, and, the, and the psychological. Um, but I want to just kind of turn the tables on us for a moment and say, hey, as... as um, whatever we would call ourselves. I think probably trusted advisors is as good as anything, right? We operate within a system that is often quite dysfunctional. It's the whole sort of professional services, billable hours model. And typically, we get to most profitable, um, we get to um, most visibility, all of these things, when we are as billable as we possibly can be. And we simultaneously often fall into the trap of um, charging or you know, receiving value for time served. Um, it's an hour and it's how much I charge for my coaching call. It's a day and it's how much I charge to deliver a workshop. It's, it's, it's a sort of a fee for service versus um, compensation for value created. And what I would encourage uh, all of us to consider is um, back to that McKinsey research. Uh, if I can be in flow, Right, I am effectively going into a place right outside of normal time where I am coming back with plutonium. I'm coming back with an energy source, an information source, an inspiration source that is so dense, that is so concentrated, that if I can bring it back through the threshold, right, into the organizations I serve, 
right? The value I'm creating, the energy I am bringing, is out of all proportion with how long it took me to go and get it. So if we can commit to, rather than thinking of our personal practices, right, whether it's attention training and meditation work, whether it's body, you know, body training and that's yoga or martial arts or, or time spent out in nature or time spent generally, whatever our personal practices are, and we've all got them, uh, the question is, is, are they our guilty pleasures? Are they the last on the list and the first to go, right, versus first on the list and the big rocks that we commit to up front? So said another way, to make this really simple, what would it be like if, I, if we built our weekly schedules such that I do nothing in the actual world of work before lunch on Mondays or after lunch on Fridays, and I effectively end up with a four-day work week, right? Still touching five business days, so I have the ability to kind of keep the plates spinning, but I commit to three days of deep focus preparation and recovery and I operate from the position of confidence that if I can do that, if I can be sourcing from the flow state that I will actually be creating far more value and I will be getting off the you know dollars for minutes kind of trap that many in the in the coaching and consulting professions earn. So in, in that is kind of both invitation the challenge is do more of what makes us come alive do more of what puts us at our, at our best, feeling our best, and performing our best. Because ultimately, transformational advisory work is about presence, how we show up, and perspective, right? What information we can bring to challenging problems. And flow states give us access to both the information and the inspiration to let us bring that into the world in, in a form of deep service, both, both to those we are explicitly working with and also to ourselves and our own paths. Mm, beautiful, beautiful words, Jamie. I'm totally thrilled uh, listening to you there. Um, and a, a question comes to mind. Um, you know, I, as a coach myself, I feel the kind of impact that I could have on my clients if I was coaching them from this flow state. And you've talked about this cycle. I'm wondering, you know, um, like, how can is there a way that we can begin to um, increase that cycle so we're able to, you know, get ourselves into into flow state, um, you know, uh, ready in time for working with our clients? You know, can we kind of um, naturally get ourselves into flow state, or do we have to go through that struggle and, you know, and then into the alpha and you know move through that cycle? Sure. I mean, you know. The simplest answer is none of this is particularly different than all of the practices we're all aware of already. Uh, and that would be anything from spending five minutes uh, engaging in some form of attention training or mindfulness, uh, eating, eating in a very clean, uh, supportive way, uh, sleeping probably more than most of us do. Um, I would say, you know, I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of eight to nine hours, sometimes even ten. Um, the, the elite athletes that we work with are typically in the sort of 10 to 10 to 12 hour range as far as deep sleep. So when they're on, they are fully on, and when they're off, they are in deep recovery. Um, there are some there are some little bits of kind of tips and tricks. I think I think the biggest uh, the, the the simplest thing that including understandings of flow and peak performance um, add to any of our normal kind of human development stuff. Like, like you know, diet, health, um, physical activities, um, mindfulness, all that. It's just that it's the turbo button. It's kind of the sort of so what at the end of it all. And uh, there is an app. Uh, I think they're just about to release for Android, but it's certainly available on iTunes um, by a company called Azumio, A-Z-U-M-I-O, and it's called uh, Stress Doctor. And they have, you know, just, just by putting your finger on the back of the camera on the phone, they have an algorithm that reads your capillary blood throat flow through your fingertip. And it measures not only heart rate, but cardiac coherence. And so it will actually sort of measure the quality 
of the beats of your heart and has a, a respiration little sort of arc and you track your breathing in and out and it gives you little symbols when you've kind of in a coherent state. So a simple thing like that um, can make a big difference in preparation for working with folks. Um, and the other is, um, I, my experience at least, is, <clears throat> is the physicality part. It's really hot. If I ever, um, if I ever find myself stressed out or you know in that kind of hijacked inner critic place, um, first question I ask myself is, hmm, has anything actually changed from this content, this word that I'm worrying about from yesterday? Is there new information? Has something destabilized? Has something gone wrong? And, and quite often it hasn't. Quite often it's just it's just gnawing at me today. And then I think, ah, oh, that's a huge a huge signal my self-system is probably low. So in general, um, I, then, then I think, okay, so you know, just back to basics. Um, food, rest, right? physical movement, all of those kind of things, and I go back to those. So it's one of those things that's a little bit like flossing your teeth. Um, there's no one amazing you know, epiphany night where I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, today was the day to floss my teeth. Um, it's more the incremental benefits over time. Um, but there certainly are things, like I said, like that Azumio app um, that can give us something to hold, you know, opposable thumbs, we're kind of distractible monkeys, and I think sometimes tools um, can allow us to play with things that we might just give up on if it was just me sitting on a cushion staring at a wall. Um, so I certainly recommend those as well. Physiological regulation is huge. Beautiful. So like by by looking after ourselves in that way, getting enough sleep, you know, looking after our bodies, eating right, and also, you know, training in certain ways like meditation and physical training, we're almost like making ourselves more likely to to be able to access that pro that flow state. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's that uh, old old Zen story of you know the, the monk who's you know his master says you know meditation's an accident and he's like well why do you have us do all this chopping wood and carry water he says to make you more accident prone, yeah. right? So so we we try to do that. Another simple one, um, breath is absent. Breath can only take place in the present moment. So when we say that flow is timeless, it is actually it occurs in the present. So I would say on the um, physiological just connecting and noticing your breathing in that moment is massive. And one of the simplest ones, they actually do use this in the Tour de France, which is relax your jaw. Typically when we get stressed and we get, when we get catapulted out of the present, um, we, we are carrying a lot of tension in our jaw. So focus on relaxing your jaw and connecting to your breath. And on a psychological level, same thing. Typically when we're, when we're struggling with what is, we're usually in a fearful future, something bad is going to happen, I have to be vigilant against it, or a painful past, right, something bad happened and I'm trying to avoid that happening again. Um, by practicing gratitude, I am, I am grateful for what is right now, uh, even, even as it's a mixed bag, um, but that can psychologically bring me back into the present. So if we can do those two things, Right, physiologically connecting to breath and what's happening, and psychologically no longer struggling against what's happening, um, and simply paying more attention to it. Um, then we can get into that place where we talked about that relaxation phase, that alpha brainwave state. It's a little bit like Mr. Miyagi in the Karate Kid, right, where he's talking and then he like catches the fly with the chopsticks. Mm. Um, uh, the the Japanese tradition is is called Zen Shin, which is effortless awareness of what's around you. Right, and if we can do that, then we're fundamentally just picking up more information, right, from the environment around us. It's like going from dial-up to broadband, and when we do that, our emotional intelligence can go up, right? Our effectiveness in the moment can go up. Our ability to intervene skillfully and help shape and shift what's arising it can start to others who aren't picking up full data feeds, it can start seeming like we're very, very skillful. But in reality, all we're doing is reading the ticker tape um, and actually paying attention to it. So the only thing that's ever happening is happening right now. Uh, and you don't need to get particularly mystical about it. You can just simply say, that's where the data feed is. So show up for it, both on a, on a physiological level uh, as well as on a sort of mental and emotional level. Beautiful. You just answered the kind of the last question I had, which was, yeah, what is it like when you enter that place, and and what becomes possible, you know, in ter in terms of like working with a client. Yeah, but I'm getting a sense, yeah, you start to pick up a which a much deeper or broader 
information range and uh, the impact you are able to have increases. Yeah, I mean, and to, to give people sort of a very felt sense of it, uh, my experience is that, again, back to that neocortex, right, that sense myself is up here, this is my Woody Allen, this is, this is where all that inner narrative is nattering on, right, and that is so fatiguing and it's destabilizing, I mean, literally just on a sort of level of, like, where's my center, where's my balance, right, it's not up here. I sort of fall over if I'm, if I'm actually logged up here. If you think about um, dancers, if you think about gymnasts, martial artists, right? They operate from their literal, their their true balance point. You're know, just just behind their belly button. Um, that is their center in any plane of motion. So the project, arguably, as we bring more flow states into our life, as we learn to sort of fill our self system up, so that our you know that transient hyperfrontality, so our neocortex can go quiet, means we take our center of gravity from up here, where we're all top heavy, and you bring it down, and you bring it down into your torso, somewhere between sort of your solar plexus and your belly button. And if you're operating from here, it's not that right back to fearful futures right, or painful past. It's not that I I cease to be aware of all these things. It's just I'm taking them on board. I'm taking them sort of under advisement from a more balanced, centered spot. In 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 uh, ski mountaineering, you know, there's always the phrase, um, you know, <laughs> you climb up something and then you're standing on something big and steep and scary, and you look at it and you think, okay, um, do I look at the rocks? Do I look at the cliffs? You think, no, you you took those under account as you climbed up the damn thing. But when it's time to make your shot, you look for the white stuff because where your head goes, right, your body flows. So mm -hmm. you, you, ski, you ski for the spaces in between the rocks. You don't look at the rocks. And I feel like when we're just up here, right, trying again to sort of seek pleasure, avoid pain, um, we spend an awful lot of time obsessing on the rocks. Mm -hmm. And when we bring our center of awareness further down into our bodies, um, you know, the first thing is like, well, wouldn't I, wouldn't I go and hit everything? You're like, actually, no. <laughs> no, because I'm actually I'm looking for the patches I'm trying to hit right here. And when mm -hmm. we interact with others that way, um, we're usually, their experience of us is usually we're more present and we're more connected to them. Um, and generally, hopefully, uh, we can be of more service as well. Mm, beautiful. Hey, well, I think, um, I feel like this has been a very rich discussion and um, I want to give you a big thank you, actually, Jamie. Um, I've been really enthralled listening to you. And um, it certainly really excites me to go out and, and look at, you know, how I can create the conditions for this state of flow to arise more as well. So just um, quickly, where can we find out more about you and what you do? Sure. So uh, our organization, you can find us uh, on Facebook uh, at Flow Genome. And feel free to look us up and connect there. We're constantly posting things, relevant news articles with a little bit of uh, Flow spin and research. And also at flowgenomeproject.co. And my partner and co-founder, uh, New York Times best-selling author Stephen Kotler, today just released his the trailer for his upcoming book called *The Rise of Superman*, which is all about flow states and the most amazing stories of the action sports community over the last couple of decades. So the rise of Superman.com is another place to plug in and uh, join Flow Hacker Nation, which is our global movement to launch the biggest, basically to take Csikszentmihalyi's work. He had 8,000 subjects in his global study. Our goal is to have 10,000 um, of members of Flow Hacker Nation all contributing our own best stories and research so that we can launch the biggest citizen science uh, research project uh, on optimal psychology the world's ever seen. So that's that's our goal. Would love you to join us. Beautiful. Well, good luck with that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye.